Hi, this is Shauna, the CEO and founder of Fuel Talent. One of the things I have loved most in my 25-year recruiting career has always been the stories that people tell. Stories of leadership, career choices, company ideas, and team building. My inspiration for starting the What Fuels You podcast came from being curious about people's lives and wanting to help share their stories. What path brought them to this place? What decisions did they make that led to failures and successes? Who influenced those decisions and what lessons were learned along the way? I hope you enjoy the What Fuels You podcast. On What Fuels You today, we will be talking with Brent Fry, the founder and chairman of Smartsheet and founder and president of his newest company and passion, TerraClear. Brent grew up on a farm in Idaho with incredible parents who he credits with some of his most fundamental values. He learned lessons about hard work from his father and learned about people from his mother. Smartsheet is now a publicly traded company, and after spending time recently in Idaho on his family farm, Brent is now focused on solving a common issue in the farming industry with TerraClear. He's the father of five children, a lover of the outdoors, and a former college football player. Love you, Brent. Thanks for being on this podcast. Hi, Jana. Hi. This is the first one I'm doing where I'm like physically looking at <laughs> my guests through a computer, but I really feel like I'm like in your kitchen, which is kind of nice. Yeah. You are. I am in your kitchen. I like it. And we're going to start with um, with rapid fire. Are you ready? Yeah. You're going to literally and figuratively be in my kitchen. Then. <laughs> okay. What's your favorite podcast? Do you listen to podcasts? Uh, I listen to AEI's podcast. Nice. What is your pet peeve? Uh, dishonesty. What's the favorite cut of meat? The filet. Oh, the filet. I like it. Mashed or baked potatoes? Mashed. What's a motto you live by? A motto I live by is, uh, I guess, leave the world a better place. I love that. What's a habit you're trying to break? Uh, focusing on the negative. What's a must-read book? A must-read. I feel like you're always good with this kind of stuff. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it is try, it not to, try not to turn off all the, the listeners right off the bat. Oh, yeah. Um, Was it like a political thing? <laughs> yeah, unfortunately. I've read a few. One of them that was I read recently was called Who Really Cares? And in it, in it uh, is a, it's an analysis of charity and people oh. that are who gives and how and why. And oh, it's interesting. interesting. Who really cares? Okay, I love it. Thank you. I always get good nuggets from you. So I had to ask you some hard ones besides mashed and baked potatoes. So you grew up in Idaho on a farm. And did you farm? Like, were you personally a farmer? Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, what, I did all the things. That what was the hardest one? one? As well. What was the hardest job? If someone's like, today you got to do the blankety blank, what would that be? Picking rock. Oh, literally it was the picking rock? That was literally the hardest job. That was the one where, it, you know, normally we would work. We'd be up and uh, we'd be out working by 6 a.m. and generally not really done during the summer hours until maybe 8 or later. And if it was harvest, it was 11 p.m. And um, the one thing that you just were pretty much done by 5 o'clock was pick and rock. And we what, even haul, who else we worked on the farm? Hmm? Who else worked on the farm? Who else worked on the farm? Yeah. I mean, is there a team and employees and all sorts of people or just a family? Uh, when I was growing up, it was just family. So mom was mom pitched in it at, at um, well, she's always pitching in in some way or another, but uh, physically pitched in uh, as one of the members during harvest. She was a truck driver. Mm -hmm. uh, and then it was generally just myself and dad. And then as my brothers and sisters got older, they, they began pitching in as well. And where are you in the birth order? How many siblings do you have? I have five. I'm second. But folks had four of us right together and then... They waited eight years and had two more. And those those two that are that are eight years behind us, um, they're kind of the genetically perfect human beings and they still farm with dad. They're, they're I don't fantastic. know that they could be more genetically perfect than you. You're a specimen, really? <laughs> well, that's what rock picking will do for you. <laughs> it gets your quads, you're up and down, up and down. So yeah. um so your siblings, um are they similar to you? I've only met one. I've just met your brother that you're in TerraClear with. Uh, all of us are different. Um, I think all of us inherited mom and dad's hard work and selflessness and integrity, uh, but we all have we all have different um, 
priorities in life. And I think different personalities. I'm probably the most sarcastic. Mm -hmm. Kim is the one that everyone loves the most. Uh, Mark is the most analytical. Colleen is the most generous and thoughtful. And it may, may also be the smartest. Um, she's a nurse and a mother of eight. Interesting. Um, and are you the yeah. outlier? Like, you know, I know you went to Dartmouth. Was that an important value for your parents? Or was it just work hard and you happened to go to Dartmouth? You know, our parents didn't didn't uh, push us into any particular thing. They didn't say, hey, you should be in sports or you should get, you know, excellent grades or we expect you to work uh, like this. Uh, they just uh, they just set a great example. And I think it made everyone want to be their best. But I'm, I'm definitely not the outlier when it comes to success. Yeah. Particularly when you define success in whatever way is is important. Right. My sister, Kim, she coaches high school boys basketball. She puts on the plays. She farms full time. She, wow. I mean, she, she does the, she teaches adult catechism. Uh, she teaches kids catechism. So wow. she is impacting probably as many lives as any of us. Uh, same yeah. thing with my sister, Shelly. She's been a special ed teacher and a special ed um, um, in programs for a good part of her life. And man, she works with some of the most difficult uh, people in and has such incredible outcomes. So I, I think success is is how you define it. Right. But in some families, you know, like I've I've talked to so many people where it was really clear that there was an expectation that their success would be measured by things like where you go to school and what you do. And so I was just curious if that came from your parents or just do they just set a good example? And so you went to public school? I, I went to Catholic grade school and public high school. So you played football, obviously, because you played in college. And so was mm -hmm. football kind of your main sport? Uh, basketball, football, and track were my sports in high school. And I guess I was a little bit better at, at football than the other ones because that's what got me into Dartmouth. Yeah. And did you look at other schools? Did you do that like high school thing where you tour and you see the five visits? And I did. I went, uh, I got recruited by a number of schools. And so I visited a bunch in Montana and Idaho and Washington. Um, and how did you I choose Dartmouth? Wyoming and, and it was interesting. I, you know, seeing those schools, they were, all of them had positives, but when I went to Dartmouth, every human being that I met there was exceptional and the professors were exceptional and the environment was exceptional. And I just knew I wanted to be there. And it, it, uh, you know, everyone's got a sort of a place and that was definitely mine. And well, I feel like to this day, like my friends who went to Dartmouth and I mean, we know people in common who went to Dartmouth, you guys are drinking the Kool-Aid still. There's something in the water there. That's like, people are very proud of their school. It seemed to feel like that was a big part of what shaped them. Well, you've met, you've met a bunch of them. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's the people like I, I, one of the philosophies I have in business is that you hire people smarter than you and you, you, you cut them loose, let them, let them make decisions and, and enroll them in everything that's going on so that they have the same information you do, because if they're smart, they'll do the right thing. Of course. And um, that was definitely my experience at Dartmouth. I was, you know, I was bottom quarter of the, of the brains there. And uh, that was <laughs> I, so fun. It was so fun to be in that environment to yeah. every day got a little bit better because of the people around you. Yeah, I love that. And so now your um, paint a picture for me. Your personality now is like sarcastic, confident, funny. What were you like in high school? And were you six seven in high school? Yeah, I grew one inch in college, so I was, oh, I was six six. six. I, was, I was. I think I graduated one hundred and ninety pounds, so that's uh, seventy pounds difference than you see me now. So yeah. I, they, I that's guess I was skinny. But I, I like to use the word lanky. <laughs> and, uh, what position did you play? I played tight end in high school. Well, so it got you. So did you go to Dartmouth on a scholarship, an athletic scholarship? Well, Ivy League doesn't give athletic scholarships. Oh, they don't. Nope. So None it was, uh, you know, I definitely had, I definitely had help from the, from the uh, sports program in, in the uh, effort to acquire aid. So yeah. to get, you know, get the aid department to understand that farmers, while they have assets, they don't have any money. And so I should at least be awarded a job. So I got, a, I got, um, they were, instead of giving me nothing, they said, you can, you can work in the kitchen. And so mm. I did. I, worked, I cleaned plates for the, my freshman year until I discovered that you can make more money delivering pizza. And what about in the summers? Would you go back to Idaho or did you do the kind of, did you do internships or what did you do in college? It was all farming. It was all farming. Was, yeah, it was, you know, it was not only what I wanted to do, but it was also, it was pretty necessary. It was pretty needed. Uh, dad needed the help for sure. Yeah. And so it, just in looking um, and doing a little research for the podcast, I know that you worked um, right out of school for big companies, Motorola, Microsoft. Um, and it looks like you had pretty short stints at those companies. Is that because you're not a big company person or you just had a bug to be an entrepreneur or like t walk me through those first few years? Well, interestingly, I, I didn't have a bug to be an entrepreneur. 
And I've actually never cared about being in charge. I just cared about being in an environment where what I'm doing, I'm sinking or swimming on my own merit and so are the, so are the people around me. And so at, at Motorola, it was pretty depressing. They had some really great market share and great technology and some very smart people, uh, but it was really the 80-20 rule where 20% of the people were doing 80% of the work. And mm. that was pretty depressing. And I kind of felt like a cog in the wheel. So you felt that you were in the 20%, but you were surrounded by people that weren't inspiring you. Yeah, definitely. The other thing was, you know, I, I could, no matter how good or bad I did, uh, it would take, or I'm, I should say, no matter how well I did, it would take two years before I could move up to be a manager. Mm. And then another- Just bureaucracy. Before, yeah, it was a tenure-based thing. I'm like, so really it's not, it's not, if you're super good, you, you can't move faster. That just seemed, that seemed It's ridiculous. To me. Yeah. Now that was not the case when I went to Microsoft. Microsoft was 15,000 people at the time and it was still pretty entrepreneurial and, and most of the groups were still fairly flat and there were a lot of smart people there and there was a lot of energy. It was probably a lot like Amazon was the last, you know, the last many years. And so that, that was pretty fun. Mm -hmm. um, it did, I, the project I worked on there with the, and the team I was on was, was pretty darn fun too. It was really small. We were international. We had very little oversight. My boss, Howard Hawk was a, was a masterful boss and you're very bright. And so it was fun. Mm -hmm. And then with the success of our project uh, came a lot of bureaucracy, a lot of, all of a sudden it became important and that mean a lot of people were on it. And many of these people were very senior to us. And so it became bureaucratic again. And I've never worked in a large company and that would drive me crazy. I wouldn't do well. One of the that. things that drove me crazy about both Motorola and Microsoft is the impact on, you know, me or the people on my team based on some decisions or some performance somewhere else in the company. And that drove me nuts. Mm. Like our bonus window didn't open because the division didn't hit its number. Yes. Meanwhile, our group just killed it. Just yeah. did incredibly well. Like, yeah. Oh, that seems kind of weird. Yeah. And um, it was the same thing at Microsoft where once we had had success, there were a lot of people that wanted to make decisions. And I thought, well, you know, I don't really care if you have credit, but don't get in my way. Yeah. Don't, don't make my job harder to deliver to the customer, which is our subsidiaries in the world. And uh, just because you want to have meetings. And so I, I, I was at that point, I told my boss, Howard, I said, I'm, I'm done. And, and was, again, How was Howard support, was he supportive and more of a mentor or more, is, how, is he still there? No, <laughs> no. Howard uh, was there for a few more years and then he came to work uh, with me at Onyx. Oh, nice. And, Good job. Yeah, a little bait, yeah, little bait and switch here. action. So um, what did you learn there about leadership, things that you wanted to take with you? And also, what did you learn about hiring and kind of how to look out for talent? Well, I learned more at Motorola and Microsoft about what I wouldn't do in leadership. Usually that's the case. And I learned the most about leadership uh, from my folks and from Dartmouth. And that, and then in, in addition to the, you know, who I would hire mm -hmm. and uh, largely is the most successful groups that I was involved in were ones that had bright people that were good team players and were, um, were, you know, just had a lot of, of, um, of personal ambition to be successful and be successful with their team. And so much of what I asked isn't specifically about someone's competence in a particular function. Hey, do you know how to do audits or do you know how to raise money? You know, if I'm looking for someone in finance or if it's someone in HR, how do you interview? Right. It has a lot to do with their personality. Like what's important to them? What do they view as their most, their biggest successes? You know, what teams have they been on? And so, you know, and those things can be in, in or outside of the business and mm -hmm. you get a feeling for the person pretty quickly. And most often people are very similar across all aspects of their life. And so, you know, if they're really proud of their family and their friends, if they, their most successful thing was some really difficult project that they and their team figured out, then it's highly likely they'll be a team oriented person. Mm -hmm. in that. How do you measure for kind of, if there's a person like those early days at Onyx or at Smartsheet, if, if they're going to be the person that's kind of also going to help you scale or if they're just a startup person? There's no science to this, but the first 20 people in all my companies have rarely been a specific talent. I mean, with a few exceptions, like a CTO or, right. um, or a, uh, you know, someone that is, is deeply technical. In You're thinking thing. more like Swiss Army knife with the right kind of DNA attitude stuff. Totally. Totally. Yeah. So, for example, we. Uh, Would we I be one of those people? Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay, good. Did your company know that you're going to leave and come and work with me? Yeah, I want to yeah. I want to be in the farming business. I love rocks. Oh, you! Uh, I would you follow are... you. You're one of the few people that I'm like. I'll do whatever you tell me to do. 
<laughs> but that's not how I work. I know, so. but I w- <laughs> I'm serious. I just like to be in your aura. I'll do it. <laughs> I love it. So tell me about Onyx. You started that company in 1994, mm-hmm. right? It's you Amazing. You and tell me about your co-founders and what, you, what problem were you solving at the time? You were solving customer management. So how do you, how do you more successfully interact with your customers so that you can win more business and keep more business, right? So t- typically what would happen is you have a system that manages your marketing and you have a system that may, that may manage your sales processes and a system that may manage your, your customer support tickets. And pretty much the only thing that wasn't central was the customer and all that. So it was all about how to automate those processes. And so if you as a customer called up Wells Fargo and said, hey, I, uh, I want to get a home loan. And by the way, this actually happened to me. I mm-hmm. called up and said, I need to get a home loan. And it was my first house and it was just a little over $200,000. And so that was really a low priced house in the Seattle area. And I had enough income to in down payment to, to make that totally valid. But there was something about my profile being a founder of a startup company that made me high risk. And so they wouldn't give it to me. And I'm thinking, gosh, if, if they were actually looking at their systems, Wells Fargo is my company's bank. And interesting. You know, no one so, was ta- no, no you know, one was talking. They're making a really poor decision because they're pissing off a customer who does a lot more business with them than a potential failed home loan on a, on an actual low risk loan. And so, you know, what what Onyx did was provide technology that said no matter what interaction you have with the customer, everybody in the organization will be able to see it, and then you can make better decisions on how you market to them, sell to them, support them based on who those people are. That's awesome. And so did you tell me about your co-founders and how this idea came to be? Was it from the Wells Fargo experience that the idea came? No, no, it was because I was doing roughly the same technology at Microsoft. Mm -hmm. That was the that was the systems that I built for them internally. And the first one we deployed in Australia and it was super successful. So did they want to come after you for this? Like, is that were they like, hey, that's our thing? Nope. One of my buddies from Dartmouth, one of my, the guys I played football with, he was also on the IT team at, at, that I was on in, at Microsoft. Mm-hmm. And so he and I were the ones that were going to leave and do this. Got it. And it turned out that Bill Newcomb, who was the general counsel for all of Microsoft, was also a Dartmouth alum. And so we emailed Bill and said, hey, can we come and see you? And so we did. And we sat down with him. We described what we were going to do. And, and Bill walked us through a really a professorial um, explanation of IP and whether or not we were going to be competing with Microsoft, who wasn't in that business at the time. And they said, you know, you guys are clear. Just don't take anything that you've built here. And, and um, you know, God bless you. Push our yeah. platform. And uh, so we know we were we were totally in the clear. So how did that first, did you just self-fund it or did you go out and raise capital? Well, we ate a lot of uh, ravioli right out of the can. Yeah, and that's we so good in the though. Basement. SpaghettiOs. There was, there was three founders. There was another guy that had been working with us at Microsoft who uh, was a contractor named Todd Stevenson. And so Todd and Brian Jansen and I uh, started in the basement. We each pitched in 50,000 bucks. Brian had it, Todd and I didn't. So we had to borrow it from people with our last names. And which is one of my favorite stories, actually, because my folks who were the least set up to give me any money, uh, literally of everybody I knew, they were the ones that did it when everyone else couldn't find it. And um, they, they benefited financially in the long run, which was pretty darn cool. Um, so we, we uh, put that much money in and we didn't really pay ourselves anything. And we uh, sort of self-funded by being small tech companies in Seattle's IT department. So Spry and Visio and uh, or CAD, and there was a whole bunch of, of small software companies that we knew a lot about IT. And so we would go in and charge them consulting fees to set up their IT. And that was partly how we funded it. And um, and then we started making money because it didn't take us long to build a product and that product worked pretty darn well. And so we were just selling it and growing as we sold and it made fundraising pretty easy. Two years in, we had made $200,000 the first year and $2 million the next year, wow. and we're on our way to 10, and then 10 turned into 20, and 20 was 35, and then we went public. We'd always been in control of our own destiny on the fundraising side because we had been running a good business. We mm-hmm. kind of started off poor. We learned how to be really efficient with our capital. Uh, we made really good decisions because we didn't have that much money, and mm-hmm. so everything was really high priority. We worked really hard. And did we you guys start hard. with really specific roles, or did they organically kind of come to be through working together? Uh, great question. They, they they organically came together, and partly because we didn't, you know, none of us had a, a you know a big ego in our bonnet that we had to be a particular thing. We mm-hmm. just sort of gravitated to the roles that were 
best suited to mm -hmm. us. It, it's interesting. My uh, my approach to um, to roles in a company is I don't actually really care. And this actually happened to one of the roles I took between Onyx and, and Smartsheet. Um, I didn't really care that much about the title and I didn't really care about that much about the responsibility because I knew that if, if, you know, if I did a good job and I knew the job I could do, that my role would be at my discretion, that I, I could earn any role that was important to me or I could take on any, because it, oftentimes what happens is the very hardest things in a company are also the most important. And then a company will look for who can handle this? Who can do this? Who can fix this? And if you're really competent and you're willing to work very hard, then you can own the hardest things. And when you own the hardest things, you control your destiny. I, I think like that's that. probably my single biggest set of advice for people is they get too focused on role and title and not focused on being the person, the go-to person in a company. That becomes indispensable. Yeah. It wasn't until we were about 30 people when the roles had to be very defined. Mm -hmm. Like the, there was really a lot of specifics around a role and, you know, which was great in some ways because then you could focus and go deep. It was kind of tough on a lot of people in some ways too, because they weren't involved in everything anymore. And that for them was a little bit of a retching feeling like, Oh, how come I don't get to look at the sales pipeline? Well, you can look at it, but that's a waste of your time. You should right. be focused on, you know, developing that platform piece. Yeah. And so with Onyx, how many people did you have and where were you revenue wise when you IPO'd? Uh, we had how many people we have? Maybe three hundred. I can. I'm not. I can't, I, the the IPO number. I'm not sure. We were we were 35 million when we IPO'd, growing 100 mm -hmm. a year, and we, yeah, I think it was 35 and 100, maybe 300 people. And then we were at our peak. We were 120 million in revenue and 800 and some people, and we had offices in 11 countries. And do you enjoy that size company? Or are you like, eh? I've done that already done it now twice, grown these huge companies, IPO'd, we haven't even gotten to Smartsheet, but it seems like you've got that kind of DNA. When are you uh, kind of flowing at your best? Is that in that early stage? Or it's, do probably you... the, it's probably the 20 to 500 people stage. 20, I, I, I very 20 much 20 to 500 that. people. <laughs> That's a big range. Those are two totally different experiences. 500 people, like for me, when people have said like, what do you want to do with the company? I'm like, I don't want I can't imagine having a 500 person company. I like to know everybody and know what's going on. Maybe it, there's something wrong with that, but. Um, yeah. Well, part of it is the, is, is an answer to the question that uh, you may ask, which is what motivates you? What in fuels business, you? What fuels you is the question. What fuels me? Yeah. <laughs> well, in business, it is working with very smart people mm -hmm. on really hard problems in giant markets. And especially in markets that there's no, no one's ever solved them before. Like well, you're no doing that now with TerraClear. The project management or the work management problem. Like, you know, it's a huge problem. It's a huge, there's 400 companies that deliver technology into that market and none of them are a runaway winner. Why not? No one's ever solved the problem. Well, in 100 years of tech, no one's ever solved the problem of picking a rock out in the field. And so people still do it by hand. Can you imagine that? We've got tractors that drive themselves, sprayers that spray just the weed that's there, and we still pick rocks by hand. So it's a so when I say twenty to five hundred people to solve a problem at, at scale in a very large market that no one has solved, you're not going to solve it with twenty people. You, yeah, no. you have to build the product and you have to take it to a market and you have to take it far and far enough into the market where the industry goes, oh, they're a winner. Yeah. I mean, there were hundreds of competitors for Smartsheet, but there were none that were like us. Yeah. I remember when we started out the company because it feels and looks like a spreadsheet, but it's organized around work instead of crunching numbers. Uh, I remember the people who were looking for money, the, the, the professional investors were like, so let me get this straight. You're building a spreadsheet to replace project and SharePoint and access. Have you guys heard of Google and Microsoft? You know, they got spreadsheets. And we're like, yeah, we've heard of them. Yeah. Okay, we're not doing the same thing. It's complimentary, kind of. Yeah. Well, I like the way that it's been described as Excel meets project meets SharePoint, because it's like visually you can kind of picture how everything kind of blends together. And But I do understand where you probably got that pushback, because you're like, well, other people are doing this. So what it's was like, it's the like differentiator? The, uh, it's like the iPhone, right? They weren't the first, you know, Apple wasn't the first company that said, hey, let's combine the pager and the email and the and the phone and the, and you know, and, the all, camera. and the camera and everything yeah. go into one device. They weren't the first ones. They were the first ones to get it right and to take advantage of some, you know, of some advances in tech. Like the bandwidth had gotten strong enough, screen resolution had gotten uh, uh, tiny enough, and they had come up with their, their big innovation was touch, the touch interface. 
And so they hit it right on. They had some timing and some design that, that really mm -hmm. worked. And that just, that just, you know, they went from zero dollars and five years later, they were making more money in revenue and profit on the iPhone than all of Microsoft was making entirely. Yeah, that's insane when you think about it. Okay, so you started touching on Smartsheet, but before that, you took a little, a little stint at Intellectual Ventures. And what, I did. What was that about? What did you do there? Was that a long-term thing or a kind of like, hey, I'm going to do this for a little bit? Well, I had just, I had just started um, Smartsheet. It had already been started. And, um, and Nathan, um, who's a super bright guy and, and a, kind of a visionary in a lot of ways, he, he uh, told me to write down a list of the reasons why I was going to do Smartsheet instead of work in intellectual ventures. And I did and went in and talked to him. And, you know, we walked down these list of reasons and he, uh, for the most part, absolved all of them, including I could continue to run Smartsheet. And um, so we had an agreement and I went to work for him. But how did you do that? Like, how did you do both those things at once? Well, sadly, I was no longer a good programmer like I was when I was in Onyx. And so when we were building the product, I thought that I could I could uh, provide product guidance in one day a week and that, that, you know, they could continue to work on it. And then as it got to a takeoff point, I could, you know, I could maybe step back in. Uh, it was pretty clear that we needed we needed more executive oversight sooner. And so that's when I hired Mark Mater, yeah. who was a guy I worked with at, at Onyx for years and you know, was there was no question in my mind he was going to be an exceptional CEO sooner rather than later. And so yeah. I talked to him into being the CEO, figuring that, you know, the things that he didn't have a ton of experience yet, you know, went around sales and marketing and finance and so forth, that I could, you know, I could provide some um, some help mm -hmm. on those things. So have you, um, you kind of mentored him, would you say? Would he call you a mentor? Uh, certainly. In those years, I was. Absolutely. <laughs> and what about you? Who have your mentors been? I'm assuming you've had some coaches and teachers along the way. Um, but what about in business? Um, yeah, that's a good question. Mostly it's been life and experience that has been the teacher. Like, so there's no, um, who's your go-to when you're wondering like, what would XYZ person do in this situation or how do I go about making this decision? Oh boy, that's a tough question. Um, I don't so, know why I feel like it's your mom. I don't know why. I could just tell she seemed so connected to you. I met her for half a second, but it just seemed like such love. Yeah, mom and I, I talk to mom probably four times a week. That's and, amazing. Uh, you know, she's she is totally connected to me, and I'm I to her. Yeah, I'll call up sometimes, and I don't have I don't have <clears throat> anything to say, and I I don't even know why I'm calling, but I just I just and mom knows it, and so she just starts talking. And oh. She's just telling me what's going on, and like it is remarkable that she what she does for me. Yeah, I love that. Um, and so when you started Smart Sheets, who was your first kind of big customer? Do you remember? At Smartsheet? Yeah. We don't have any big customers, or we didn't have any big customers. We only charged people like 99 bucks a year. So it was, it was but tiny. Isn't it wasn't it per, just per company, per head? I mean, I don't understand that. What do you mean 99 bucks a year? It was just per creator, whoever wanted to create something. And so you, you Shauna, you could have created a sheet that tracks all of your people that you're hiring. You could share it with your whole company and all the companies you work with, and all those people would be free. And you would just pay be paying $16 a month for a license. For me as an individual. No, for you as a company. You had to sell a lot of companies. So I got a funny story. It's yeah, I need to hear I need to hear the story because I'm confused on how we built something that was useful enough that lots of people would want to track their work with it. Mm -hmm. Whatever that work looked like. Whether it was someone tracking and managing every moving part of the Super Bowl, or if it was, you know, Uber using it to track all of the incidents for their drivers around the United States, or it was the, you know, the lady up in the church on Bellevue way that uses it to track all the donations for the charity auction. It it's, could be really, you know, big or really small, but the people that they would then be coordinating stuff with that would be on there and using it would go, gosh, this is great. I can use it for my thing. And then they would be, they would want to create a new product. They create a new sheet or a new set of sheets. And so then they'd have to become a paying customer at that point. And the idea was that if we designed it well enough, that, that that would be a great viral approach to to winning business. Instead of you, Shauna, going, oh, I'm going to use this, but every time I add another person to my company, I got to pay more dollars. Mm. You're, you're not incented to share it with everybody in your company. So our bet was that we could build a good enough product that it would win business by capturing every single person that they that used it to then use it for something that was specific to them. And so we do. So that has happened. So there's some of our biggest customers pay us over $2 million a year because they have so many people in their company that just personally need it for their own thing or for their group or for their team. And so they create and manage stuff. 
Oh, interesting. And, so is there a moment, so when I asked who is the big customer and you say, no, you know, not really any one big customer, is there a moment when you're like, the flywheel is on? Like, whoa, we just kind of hit it. Yeah, when uh, the, the re- there were several moments, but one of them was one of the biggest companies in the world called us up and we had never had a sales call with them. And they had uh, 70 different groups inside their company, that, some, some very big and some very small that were using Smartsheet for entirely different things around the globe. And they said, hey, you guys aren't actually uh, certified, you know, in our company. And so you haven't gone through any sort of a, of a you know, a, a IT test to make sure that you're, that you're secure. Uh, but we can't seem to get rid of you because so many people are using it. Can, you, can we just do a big deal with you? And so everybody can be on the same license and we can get you certified. Oh, I'm nice. Like, this is you're like, we can do that. What stage of the company was that? Okay. Oh, what gosh, year? What you it started it in 2005. Now, probably six or seven six years or seven old. Years in. So the first few years, um, would you describe them as being kind of startup-y and emotional and struggle and hard? I think until we got to year four, I was probably the only person in the whole company that never gave up. Because everybody was like, eh, I think I need to go find a new job or figure this out in a new way. No, they weren't looking to leave or anything. They weren't sure that we it was going to be a winner. They, everyone, every one of them had a crisis of confidence in the business. They didn't. They weren't like not motivated to be be there or work, mm-hmm. but they were like, I don't know if we can do this. I don't think it's going to be successful. And so it was. I had to be the one guy that was the, the whole thing was like, No, we're going to make it. We're going to get there. It's going to work. It's going to work. It's going to be okay. And you know, reassuring them that we weren't going to run out of money. That we. Where's know, the we money coming from? Money. Were you fund mm-hmm. at this point? Were you in the beginning? Were you funding the business through the business, or did you get capital? <laughs> you fundraised from who? Well, so I put in a lot of money to mm-hmm. start with, and then we raised money from friends and family, mm-hmm. and then we raised money from Madrona, mm-hmm. who turned out to be a magnificent partner. And then, um, and then we right after we raised money from Madrona, we said, "Oh crap, our product's not quite right. We're gonna have to rebuild it." Uh, we're going to sort of go into hibernation for 18 months while we rebuild this. And Madonna's like, gulp. Yeah, I'm sure they were like, but, awesome. Yeah, but, you know, kudos to Matt McElwain for being a, you know, visionary stalwart for us. He was fantastic, as in it continued to be fantastic. He, um, he stuck it out. And then 18 months went by and we were down to about three months cash in the bank. And, and uh, I was sort of rounding up because I had run out of money. I was Personally? Sort of rounding, yeah. So I was going to yeah. have to sell the house. And you had, gonna, you had kids at this point? Five. But when we, we, we released that version of the rewrite, we had sort of three bets, three ways of, 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 of what we thought were going to help us make this thing a winner. And we thought if any one of them hit, we would be okay. And it turned out all three of them hit. And so when we came out the other side, all of a sudden we didn't have three, we had four and then we had five and then six months of cash in the bank. And so we just skimmed the treetops, but pulled out. And um, it was at that point where we kind of looked at each other witnessing who was picking up the product and how fast they were adopting it and the, the, the diversity of industries and outside the U.S. and everyone were like, oh my gosh, this thing's going to be huge. And uh, the fact that my team actually made a, 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 a sign for me and put it in my office that says we're going to be huge. And, and we are. And you are. So what was the, what was this that I read about that within one year was at 2016 to 17 or 17, to, the fiscal year, 67 million to 111 million? Is that true? Yeah, I don't Real? remember the exact numbers. That was the numbers probably. that I read about. That's like crazy growth. So your current role is director. So is there an active role that you're playing or is just going to board meetings? Yeah. So, you know, staying involved with the company, knowing what's going on so that at board meetings and in between board meetings, if necessary, anything that we, any decisions that we make on behalf of the shareholders or on, or any advice that the management team is looking for, we, you know, we can provide that. Got it. And so, but most of your time now and energy is on, obviously, when you're not with your five kids, because you're like super dad beyond, which we will discuss, um, you're focused on Tara Claire. I am. Yes. And are you working like you did back in the early days of Onyx and Smartsheet, just like crazy? No. I mean, I'm, I'm wholly focused, have the same level of determination around success, because I think you've got to be, you've got to be determined to succeed or die, or there's likely you will die, your company will die. So I have that same level of intensity and in, in work ethic. But no, my, my, primary, my primary focus now is being a really good full-time focused dad. Yeah, you're good at that because I want to hear about more about the kids and where they're at. How old are they now? Uh, the oldest is 11 and the youngest is 6. 
Would you describe any of them as mini me's similar to you personality wise? Uh, one of the twins, one of the twin girls is. Yeah. She's the mini me. Yeah. It's kind of cool that you're raising them around um, this kind of startup gritty drive determination, but also just the humility that comes from kind of hard work on a farm, like to give your kids both of those things because they're being raised with money around them. Right. Like how do you keep them grounded? Well, Shauna, you're, you're, you have zeroed in on almost a hundred and a hundred percent of the reason for Terra Clear is I grew up on a farm in an environment with incredible parents hard work, no money, you know, selflessness, they, you know, with no money and no time, they still pitched in for charity. And it was, it was a lesson that has enabled me to be who I am today. And that, and, and to have the, the fortitude to be successful at the things that are important. And so I look at my kids growing up in the city, where it's kind of, you know, you've got your little quarter acre square box next to the square box and, and the ability for them to go out and have the same project based and, and, you know, and, and experience based learning that I had in an environment where they can get their, you know, their hands on the things that they're doing growing up from a young age. I mean, I drove a tractor at six. There's not that much opportunity for them. Plus, you know, when you go to work and you stand behind a computer for, you know, X hours a day, bringing your kid to work is kind of a, is kind of a downer too. Yeah. Now, when you bring your kid to work in Idaho at, on the farm, they're driving a combine. I they're working with you that. in the bank. I want my kids to come. They're salting the hay. They're, you know, they're helping herd the cows through the fence. I mean, it's, it's the real deal. It's like they, they have a, they have a, a meaningful hands-on rewarded feeling about like I contributed. Oh so yeah. They learn, how things, they learn how things work too. And, and that's, that's, that's really big. And so the, the design for TerraClear was, was many fold. One was it is, it's, <laughs> It gives me a good reason to be in my hometown in Grangeville, Idaho, because that's our testing facility. So it's a, you know, it gets, it gets some of the business there mm -hmm. and, it, and, the, and the kids can participate in this business. It's a business they can totally understand. Uh, we sit around the table with a big piece of butcher paper and we do design ideas and we talk about why it's this way. And the kids have lots of opinions because they can totally grok what it's doing. That's and, so cool. You know, and I set it up specifically so that I am only expected to be at the office two days a week because I'm a dad the rest of the time and th they'd have my hundred percent focus. You're living your values as opposed to just talking about them. Yeah. So I saw some of the prototypes and the different designs that when you stood up at the GeekWire Summit, which was super cool. Where are you now relative to where you were? Like, are you selling? Who are you selling these to? No, we're in, the, we're in the process of trying to get those designs out to Idaho to test. Mm -hmm. And to, um, and because when we get those prototypes out there and we begin testing, we can also uh, get a bunch of the old timers who have designed a lot of equipment and run a lot of equipment and mechanic a lot of equipment. We can get them in to, to look at it. And it's super interesting because in that area are people that have designed, like there's a, there's a group that has designed all 98% 90, of all of the technology that goes into hillside combines. And it's all built there, right? And in it's the, right, right there. The, yeah, I mean, there, there's there's a re, there's a real deal there, and so to um, you know, we 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 think our design is quite good, but it, it will be the, the the proof will be in the field. Yeah. And the, you know, oh gosh, we didn't anticipate it driving on a hillside. Now it's tipping over. Those so, are yeah. Those are all interesting things that you'll see when it's in action. Yeah. That's pretty cool. And so, are there? You said you have eleven people. Is it a, it's a different profile or the same type of profile that you would look for at Smartsheet? It's people that you, uh, you just know that if you were in a, you know, if you're in a dire situation, you'd want them on your team. Or if yeah. you were, you know, you were going to, they're just, you, you can, you can tell, you can feel it. And mm -hmm. they're self-motivated. They don't require management. They, you know, they anticipate problems. They're great problem solvers. Mm -hmm. uh, they're, I mean, I love them because the, I, I don't know that I, if I sat down with a piece of paper and designed human beings, I could have, I could have designed these people. Like who in the world is a, you know, is a, a Navy underwater welder and a robotics programmer. One of the people I mean, on your team. He's a mechanical engineer, but also knows a ton about wave, wave and uh, systems um, modeling. Yeah. I mean, just the, are, you think, are, are you thinking yet about culture for TerraClear? Well, the culture is going, to, is going to be a reflection of us, of the people that have founded it. And yeah. so hopefully, it's, you know, it has the same level of integrity and passion and, and, team or, and teamwork that, you know, that we has made us I mean, at Onyx and at Smartsheet. Uh, we were recognized in, in Washington State.
did as best companies to work for. I don't think combined seven or eight times. Yeah. And yeah. You know, that's, that's by design. It's because if you set up the right environment for really, uh, really, really good people, that that's a natural outcome. Yeah. So it's, it's, just, it's the same formula. You, I know that you've asked um, candidates a lot, kind of what they're most proud of as a way to measure kind of what they're about. Um, and I like to ask that question too, but I know that one of the things you're most proud of is your children. You know, my family and my kids and my friends, it's, you have a, sometimes you don't have a choice for who you're, you know, what family you're born into, but you do have a choice for the family you create and you do have a choice for your friends. And I think that that's a great reflection on who you are. I totally agree. So is that what you would say? You're most proud of your friends because your kids too, but that's like everyone says their kids. So your friends, would you say? My friends and my family. Absolutely. That's awesome. When you're not with your kids and when you're not working, how do you like to decompress? <laughs> you, you assume there's any time after those two Come games? on, five kids. <laughs> well, I like the outdoors a lot. Mm-hmm. And, um, Hiking? And I like, imp- I like, I'm like my dad, I like improving things. So I'll go on the cattle ranch and I'll, you know, repair a fence or I'll clear out the brush or I'll. Can you come to my house? <laughs> <laughs> so I, just, I like the process of improvement. I like, I just, I like making things better and more valuable. And that's, that to me is fun. I, I have yeah. a hard time if, if I'm like talking on the phone, a lot of times my mom will be going, what's that noise? You know, because I'm sweeping off a deck. Like I want to do, get a lot of stuff done at the same time. Yeah. You like to feel productive. So, but what about if you just wanted to completely relieve stress do you have any go-to things or you don't need that somehow you figured it out um i'll watch a movie or a football game nice what three words would the kids use to describe you and how is that different than uh how your colleagues would describe you (laughs) um i think they would describe me as funny I would too. Um, I think they would describe me as um, loving that they uh, that I love them. But I think they would all say that we have a little we have a little sign language stuff that we do between each other to say I love you. Your colleagues? <laughs> no, no, I, Are you well, signing should, to your colleagues? Should have that. I love you. Yeah, if you met these guys and you saw us say I, I, I love you to each other, you would make you laugh. <laughs> Hey. Um, something you're working on kind of maybe changing about yourself or trying not to be, did you say negative, negative thoughts? Yeah. So negative thoughts of just, but you don't seem negative. You seem like you're the person's like, we're going to get through this. We're going to do this. But well, are you, I am. are the you faking it? I, do, though, is I tend to focus on what can go wrong. Oh, that's I mean, good. I think, a, I think it's a strength. Yeah. But that's it's great. Also, it also can, it also can create, you know, a negative focus. It's like, okay. Instead of taking a second going, wow, that is a great design. You guys really solved a bunch of the a bunch of our issues there. The first thing that pops in my head is, well, that's gonna run into the dirt. Why'd you do that? Yeah. And then, you know, <laughs> you gotta do one they they say like, um, yeah, start out with the compliments. So my final question for you, you said what fuels you in business? What fuels you in life? Like what kind of legacy do you wanna leave on this world? As far as what word would you want people in the world to describe to use to describe you? I want it to be a better place because I was here. It will be. One rock at a time. One spreadsheet <laughs> at a time. I love it. Do you have questions for me? Yeah, what's the been the what's been the biggest aha for you in any of these podcasts or even this one? Um, I think the coolest part is that you just realize that everyone has a story and that it's not like you meet people and you kind of think you're when you're meeting someone who's very successful, you're just kind of assuming everything's easy and you're not realizing that everybody has challenges and setbacks. Some people that I've spoken to have spoken about a lot of vulnerabilities and areas where um, they have felt weak. And it makes me realize that everybody's just trying to do their best and everybody wants the same things, which is to kind of improve and make the world better and learn and grow and be a good parent, all the things that we've talked about. So in the words of my dearly departed Uncle Jim, he used to always say that everybody is a C average. And I believe that to its core. And even the most successful, smartest, most notoriety, you know, most the people with the most notoriety in the world, you're absolutely right. You know, there's something they're dealing with 
that is it's big and it's tough and they're vulnerable in it. And I, and I've seen it for through a lot of these people and that I worked with. And, um, I, you know, you've got, you've got characteristics that I envy in a big way. Oh, you are, thanks. Keep that part on the podcast. Don't edit that part out. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, your ability thanks. to connect to people and influence you. and that's, you know, it, it's really, it's unbelievable. That's really sweet, Brent. Thank you. I'm glad that we're friends. It's a, it's a fun friendship. I want more of it. It's awesome. And thanks for doing the podcast. I'm going to make you come to Seattle one of these days, <laughs> torture you on Capitol Hill. Um, and I'll see you soon. Yeah. I'm super grateful. Bye. Thank you for listening to the What Fuels You podcast. Be sure to subscribe, rate, and review on iTunes, Google Podcasts, or Spotify, and follow us on social media to keep up with the latest news and episodes. You can also contact us at podcast at fueltalent.com to provide feedback, ask questions, and share topics or guests you would like us to cover in the future. We hope you feel inspired by our guests and that we have helped fuel your day. Join us next time for another episode of What Fuels You. 